All right, so today we're going to talk about the conservation of momentum. Something is conserved just like in energy, the energy before equals energy after. I bet you this time the momentum before is going to equal the momentum after. Let's see if I'm correct. So in an isolated system, as isolated and closed, the total momentum of the system remains constant. Oh, I was right. I'm so smart. So an isolated system means that there is no external forces. There's no forces coming in from the outside there. Uh, closed system, no mass enters or leaves. So you have the same mass the whole time within the system, and you're going to have no net external forces on the system. The momentum of each body may change, but the total momentum is going to be the same throughout the whole time. That should be a lowercase p. Not bad. Should be a little p. So momentum of each object, so like this guy's momentum before and this guy's momentum before might be different afterwards, but the total momentum when you add all these momentums up is going to be the same in each part, before, during, and after. It's always going to be the same. So just like this one astronaut giving the other astronaut a hug, see they collide, they stick together. They're in outer space, oh, they're going to show it again, yeah, there we go. So they collide, their masses combine, now they share a velocity because they're happy little astronauts. All right, uh -huh. my animations are off a little bit on this one, but oh well. All right, so how we get the equations for conservation of momentum, we start with the impulse momentum theorem, which was the impulse, which is force times delta T equals the momentum after minus momentum before. So that was the force of the second object on the first one. This equation is the force of this first one on the second one. Now, Newton's second law tells us, or Newton's third law, sorry, I'm a physicist, I should know the difference between those. This force and this force are equal, but they are opposite. See? Equal and opposite. There's only a little negative shine in there. And the time that they're in contact with each other is also going to be the same. You can't have two different times. Like, I can't touch my desk longer than my, dex, de, my uh, desk touches me. That's just kind of creepy sounding. So therefore, momentum of the first times velocity final of the first mm -hmm. minus momentum of the first times the, the initial velocity of the first equals the negative of all this junk over here, which is the momentum for the second guy. So therefore, putting it all together, getting rid of that negative sign, bringing all the f's to one side and the i's to the other, we get the initial momentum of the first one plus the initial momentum of the second one equals the final momentum of the first one plus the final momentum of the second one. So all this is is p1 initial, p1, p2 initial, p1 final, and p2 final. So when no external forces act on a system consisting of two objects that collide with each other, the total momentum of the system remains constant. So that means no change in net momentum. Each object momentum can change, but the total momentum stays the same. So the total change in momentum is zero. So here's our equation again for impulse. So this is our impulse, the force times the change in time equals the change in momentum equals the final momentum minus initial momentum. So whenever our net force equals zero, which is what we're saying in our conservation, the total momentum, our total force equals zero. And therefore, for an isolated system, our final is going to equal our initial. And therefore, that's another way we get this equation. Final momentum, momentum equals the initial momentum. Sorry, that's a little bit confusing. It's really not that hard. Momentum before equals momentum after. That's all you got to remember. And we're talking about momentum before. It's two objects, so both of their momentums equal their momentums after. So here's a quick little problem. There's an archer. He's standing on a frozen pond. He's going to shoot a helpless little deer. Deer do taste really good, so that's probably why he's shooting it. So he's standing, and we can assume that this ice is frictionless. And he's going to fire a half kilogram arrow horizontally at 50 meters per second. The total mass of the archer and bow that's without the arrow is 60 kilograms. So with what velocity does the archer move across the ice after firing the arrow? 
So we got to remember that the initial momentum is going to equal the final momentum. So we have our equations for all the initials and finals. And we write down what we know. We know the mass. We're going to call M1 the mass of the archer and the bow. We're going to call M2 the mass of the arrow. We know initially the archer is moving with zero speed, He's staying right there. We also know initially the arrow is moving with zero speed. But the final velocity of the arrow is 50 meters per second. So we're going to want to put 50 meters per second in here. We're looking for this guy right here. So since all these guys equal zero on this side, zero, zero, we have zero equals the final momentum of the archer and the bow plus the final momentum of the arrow. Pretty straightforward solving from there. Just going to solve this guy for V1F. Solve it for this guy right here. That's what we're looking for. You rearrange your equation. This is what you get. Plug in some numbers. Do some calculations. Kilograms cancel each other out. Lots of meters per second. So you get that the bow and the archer are going to move backwards. See this negative sign here it means he's moving backwards. He's moving this way. At negative 0.417 meters per second. He's going to move backwards when he shoots that arrow. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, they're trying to come up with new ways for space travel. And one of their engines they're talking about is, is called an impulse engine. And that's exact. An impulse engine works exactly like this archer and arrow guy. But instead of firing one arrow very slowly, an impulse engine fires a lot of arrows. Not really arrows, but some small masses. Uh, in rapid succession. And with each one of those firings of these masses, the spaceship speeds up faster and faster and faster and faster until it gets like ridiculously fast. Because there's nothing else in space to slow it down. So that's how an impulse engine works. Pretty neat. Bye, Mr. Archer. Hope you got your deer. They're tasty. All right, quick little problem. A 100 kilogram man and a 50 kilogram woman on ice skates stand facing each other. So you got, you got a guy here. Hi, I'm a guy. And we have a girl here. She's smaller. She's only 50 kilograms. We know she's a girl because she has hair. She's got a dress on and no neck. And oh my god, don't push me. Alright, so if the woman pushes the man backwards so that his final speed is one meter per second, at what speed does she go? So we know this guy's going to go this way at one meter per second. We want to know how fast the woman goes. So the velocity of the woman equals what? And we know this guy is 100 kgs. And La Chica is 50 kgs. So initially, both the momentums are zero. So do I do this problem out? No, I don't. So we know the initial momentum equals the final momentum. So we know mass of the man, velocity of the man, initial, plus mass of the woman, velocity of the woman, initial, equals mass of the man, velocity of the man, final, plus mass of the woman, velocity of the woman, final. But both of these people start at zero, so that's all zero on this side. So all we're left with is zero equals mass of the man, velocity of the man, final, plus mass of the woman, velocity of the woman, final. We know the mass of the man, we know the mass of the woman, we know the velocity of the man. Now we just got to solve for the velocity of the woman here. So we get that all on each side. So we're solve for that. So we get negative mass of the man, velocity of the man, final equals mass of the woman, velocity of the woman, final. And from that we get final velocity of the woman equals negative mass man, velocity man, final, divided by mass of the woman. Plug in our numbers, so negative 100 kgs times negative 1 meters per second 
divided by 50 kgs. Kgs are gone, electric meters per second, that's good because we're trying to have velocity. Negative 100 times negative 1 is just 100 divided by 50 is 2. So we get 2 meters per second. So she's going to go this way at 2 meters per second. Which makes sense. She has half the mass, she's going to have twice the speed. There are a couple of different types of collisions that we're going to be talking about. But in all collisions, momentum is conserved. First type of collision we're going to talk about is uh, inelastic. So inelastic collisions would be something like between a rubber ball and a hard ball. So in inelastic collisions, the kinetic energy is not conserved. And in a perfectly inelastic collisions occur when the objects stick together. It's like if I threw a lump of putty at a brick wall, like it's probably going to stick together. Perfectly inelastic. Now, elastic collisions would be like if you're ever playing a game of pool and you hit the cue ball off another ball, the other ball is going to bounce off. They're obviously not going to stick together. So both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved in elastic collisions. And in actual collisions in the real world, like whenever you know automobiles get in accidents, they usually have both elastic and inelastic characteristics. We're only going to worry about the uh, ends of the spectrum, the inelastic and the elastic. So in summary, in an elastic collision, both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. In a non-perfect inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, but kin kinetic energy is not. Moreover, the objects do not stick together. And in a perfectly inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is not, and the objects stick together after the collision. So their final velocities are the same. They travel with the same velocity. So just like that astronauts in the very first slide, one astronaut's going to come and he's going to hug the other astronaut, and they're going to travel together as, you know, the astronaut pair. So elastic and perfectly inelastic collisions are limiting cases. Uh, most actual collisions are a combination of both of those two. But in every collision, momentum is conserved. So we can choose our conservation momentum equations. So we're going to talk about perfectly inelastic ones first. So when two objects stick together after the collision, they have undergone a perfectly elastic collision. See, this ball is going this way, this ball is coming this way, but afterwards they stick together, so their combined mass, and they're going to have the same velocity. It's actually a really simple equation to use since uh, momentum is conserved. And since they have the same final velocity and their masses are combined, we just know the momentum of the first ball to start plus the momentum of the second ball equals their combined mass and their final velocity. Those ones are actually a lot easier to work with than uh, the elastic ones. And if we solve for VF, this is what you get. This is just this equation rearranged. Uh, and kinetic energy is not conserved in any elastic collisions. So here is an SUV versus a compact car. So an SUV with a mass of 1800 kilograms is traveling eastbound at 15 meters per second. So this guy is going this away at 15 meters per second. While a compact car with only 900 kilograms, so half the mass, is traveling westbound at negative 15. So it's going this way at negative 15 meters per second. The cars collide head on, becoming entangled. So you gotta look for words like entangled, because that means it's perfectly inelastic, which means they stick together. So this mass plus this mass is going to equal our final mass. So first we're going to find the speed of the entangled cars after the collision. And then we're going to find the change in velocity of each car. And the change in kinetic energy of the system consisting of both cars. First the speed. That's the easiest one. So we write down everything we know. We know the mass of the SUV is that. The initial velocity of the SUV is that. Mass of the second, velocity of the second, are those guys. And the initial momentum equals final momentum. And there's our inelastic equation. Solve for final velocity. We plug all of our numbers in from over here into this guy. 
take my word on it, you get 5 meters per second. So that means this final velocity of both of them together is 5 meters per second. So now we know that this final velocity is 5 meters per second. All right, and now we're going to find the change in velocity of each car. Remember, when we're doing change of velocities, it's the final velocity minus the initial velocity. So the initial velocity for car one was 15 meters per second. So this is going to be our 5 meters per second, which is this guy, minus our 10, or 15, sorry, 15 meters per second, which gives us a change of negative 10. And do the same thing for the uh, little car. He's initially going negative 15. I'm sorry. The final velocity is 5 meters per second. His initial velocity is negative 15. 5 minus negative 15 gives us a positive 20. Um, we can also find the... Uh, change of momentum for each car. So the change of momentum for the first car is going to be this guy. Because we already figured this out right here. Mass 1 means we're talking about the first car. Change of momentum or its impulse is this. And we know that the net impulse has to equal 0. So we know that the second car has to have the same impulse but in the opposite direction. So impulse of the second is equal and opposite to the impulse of the first one. Now we're going to find the change in kinetic energy of the system. So change in kinetic energy, still the same data we got over there. Still the same final velocity. So now we just have to find the initial kinetic energy. So we plug in the mass of the first car, the initial velocity of the first car, mass of the second, initial velocity of the second. When you plug all your stuff in from over here, you get 3.04 times 10 to the 5 joules. Now we've got to find the final velocity. Now both of these guys have the same final velocity. So we're putting in 5 meters per second for both of our Vs right here. And then the mass of the first, mass of the second. And you get 3.38 times 10 to the 4 joules. Now we subtract the final minus the initial. You get negative 2.7 times 10 to the 5 joules. So you can see that the change of kinetic energy is definitely not zero. The big loss of energy there. Now we're going to talk about elastic collisions. So elastic, we can't, we won't, we're not going to have a nice equation on the right hand side. We have to leave it like this because we can't combine the masses because they're going to have different velocities. But it is nice because the kinetic energies are going to be equal on both sides. So our initial kinetic energy is going to equal our final total kinetic energy. As I already said, both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. You typically are going to have two unknowns, which kind of sucks. And you got to remember that momentum is a vector quantity, so something going right is positive, which is why you always want to draw your little legend arrow down here, showing that the right direction is positive x. Anything going left is usually going to be negative. Because direction is very important. It determines the sign on your velocities, which isn't so important in the kinetic energy stuff and squaring it, but it's definitely important in the momentum stuff. So be sure to have your correct signs. And we might have to solve some equations simultaneously. Eh, it gets tricky. That's why we do problems in class. So a summary of the types of collisions, and then we'll be done with this guy. In an elastic collision, both momentum and Ke are conserved. In elastic collisions, momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not. So elastic collision, we're really just worried about our velocities here comes from those guys, especially if our, uh, moment, or if our masses are the same for both, like shooting pool. There's a lot of pool examples in your uh, homework problems, or classwork problems. So you can just get rid of the masses if they're all the same and just worry about velocities. In an inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not. So we still have the same momentum, but we're going to have different kinetic energies. And in perfectly inelastic collisions, they stick together so we can combine their masses because they're going to have the same velocity in the end. So just a, another quick little problem to wrap it up. An object of mass m moves to the right with a speed of v. 
It collides head-on with an object of mass 3m, moving with speed of only one-third of v3 in the opposite direction. If the two objects are together, what is the speed of the combined object of mass 4 meters after the collision? So initial momentum equals final momentum. So the mass of the first guy is just m. He's moving to the right, so it's positive, with a speed v. Flies head on with an object with a mass of 3m, so 3m, moving with a speed of v divided by 3 times v divided by 3. Oh, look, these guys cancel out, so I'm just left with mv plus mv. And we want to know what the final velocity of this guy is. So we know it's 4m, and we're looking for that final velocity. That's what we're trying to find. Each of these guys got an m in it. We can cross them out. Combine these two guys. So 2v equals 4vf. Solve this guy for vf. You get 1 half v equals vf. So v over 2. That is it. Thanks for bearing with me through that one. Adios.